Slow and sleepy, but incredibly powerful when roused, Espinas is one of the most mysterious and yet revered beasts in the known world. Its even temperament extends to most who don't threaten it, but a few mad few still choose to hunt it. But despite its power and wyvern lineage, it mainly eats small prey. So let's see what we can do to unpack the enigma that is Espinas. And one of Espinas's signature behaviours is just how much of a sleepy boy he is. They can typically be found resting for long periods of the day, and are difficult and slow to wake. In short, if they can help it, Espinas just do what they can to not expend energy. And with a sluggish nature and long rest periods, they likely have a relatively low metabolic rate. But this isn't always the case. Once properly woken up, Espinas is capable of incredible feats of strength, and fights as fiercely as other wyverns he's considered on a similar level to. So it's likely Espinas can alter its own metabolic rate for various reasons. For most of the time, Espinas keeps things on the down low. And even comparatively strenuous activities like hunting and movement, it may still not really charge itself up for. Forcibly waking Espinas does the trick of getting it fully active. And like anything else, Espinas is probably pretty willing to burn the calories to protect its own life. But the more natural and seasonal cause for it still having the option to kick things up a notch is likely reproduction. In Tigus, we see something similar. Whilst for most of the year their metabolic rates are pretty similar to other lizards, come the reproductive season, their metabolism spikes considerably, and they become much more active, becoming somewhat endothermic. And this is all to breed. Males have to produce sperm, find females, and repel rival males. And females have to produce eggs, build nests, and then guard them. And it isn't just tegus. Monotremes like echidnas and primitive mammals like tenrex also undergo enhanced endothermy when it comes to reproduction, and for the same reasons. So Espinas may well be similar, and they likely have a set season they breed in and become a lot more active at this period. Individuals will be burning a lot more energy with them moving and eating more, and in the case of the males, flattening sections of forest in combat. Bull Espinas fights likely comprise of opponents trying to angle the horn to gore each other's soft underparts, and flip each other over, with a successful flip likely showing a clear winner and the loser fleeing in a hurry. Some conflicts may be averted though. Espinas has a blue tongue, a lot like the blue-tongued skink, and whilst this was initially thought to be a clear-cut predator repellent by aposematism, it may not be that simple. Some of the skink's predators don't see that wavelength of light, or aren't in a position to be exposed to it. Rather, it's believed this is for other reptiles, and chiefly other skinks in particular, being to reduce skink-on-skink -skink violence among their own kind by having a clear warning to others. Predator defense may just be a secondary feature, so perhaps Espinash try to regulate their own conflict giving each other blue-tongued warnings before to try and prevent a fight breaking out at least some of the time. Female Espinas will be busy making nests, and in the rich leaf litter, Espinas nests likely compose of a mound of decomposing vegetation to keep the eggs warm, camouflaged and sheltered whilst protected by the mother. Once hatched too, Espinas may live much of its life in the slow lane. Whilst it may have a speedier metabolism as a chick, Compared to other wyverns, it may be comparatively slow growing, and take a lot longer to reach sexual maturity. But with the added bonus that relative to body mass, Espinas may be some of the longest lived wyverns. The jungle environment may also be a key factor in why Espinas went down this route in the first place too. As said a few times before, jungles rarely teem with large amounts of herbivore biomass. Existing large herbivores are scattered at low densities, and smaller ones are often at least partially arboreal, making them hard to reach. In short, not huge amounts for a big game hunter to eat. When the Espinas ancestor arrived in jungle areas, it was likely a more typical wyvern like Rathian, a chiefly ground-based predator but with some volant capacity. Keeping your metabolism low for much of the year would definitely be a trait selected for among them, to deal with the comparative food scarcity as well as the prey switching over time to smaller, low-effort prey items that can be caught easily and regularly. Espinas may still have a lunge for a big game occasionally, and will readily scavenge any carcass, 
but for the most part it's a wyvern that's moved away from macro predation due to its environment, and settled into life in the slow lane. The hot jungle environment may also help it stay warm too, allowing Espinas to rest with minimal energy to keep homeostasis ticking over. Evolutionarily too, Espinas may not have fallen so far from the family tree. In I Am the Kaiju King's family tree of wyverns, Espinas is in the hard-shelled wyvern family, with basil juice, the wraths, and the bloss wyverns among others. And the ability to exhibit metabolic control may be a staple of this family. Basil juice is confirmed to be able to do so for the production of its bombs, and presumably to lower its metabolic rate further for rest periods. It doesn't seem overt in the wraths, but it would be a very useful ability to have for single nesting rathians. Lowering metabolism while brooding would mean the mother can spend more time in the nest protecting the eggs, and will overall need less food as well, both crucial traits with the potential amount of nest predators and low densities of prey in areas where singletons often nest. The bloss wyverns may be something of an anomaly, and with low food density as herbivores they may be comparatively active animals over much of the 24 hour period, moving between foraging patches and so this comparatively high activity rate means they have a higher average metabolism. Espinasa's lethargic demeanour extends to many aspects of its day-to-day -day life, and includes feeding too. Despite its power and being well-armed, Espinas prefers small, low-effort prey that can be caught regularly and easily, and so it's no surprise it helps itself to the banquet of invertebrates that the jungles of the known world have to offer. Espinas hunts almost like a giant heron, waiting in place potentially for very long periods of time for something to emerge from the leaf litter before it strikes. Espinas does have pronounced ears, albeit not to the extent of sympatric bird wyverns like Yandkutku and Garuga, but primarily it likely uses its great sense of smell. When foraging, Espinas can be seen sniffing areas before waiting, and so it does seem it uses primarily olfactory foraging versus the Yan's auditory. It's worth noting too, Espinas has something of a gut, much more so than other flying wyverns. This is unlikely to be a fat store, and is more likely to be an enlarged digestive system, and may imply Espinas could potentially even take some plant matter into its diet too, even if just high energy foods like fallen fruit or nuts. It may also be that with his low metabolism, Espinas breaks food down over long periods of time too. Hornitors are one such common prey item, and with a diet of a lot of bugs, that's going to result in eating a lot of chitin. Some specialised insectivores have enzymes capable of partially breaking down chitin, for some extra carbohydrate energy, so Espinas may use a very long gut retention time to suck all the possible nutrients out of its prey. Another item on the menu may be hermitors. The giant rainforest lake area is a breeding ground for the adult daimyos, who as well as water seem to require chiefly sandy soils for breeding and general habitat. And it can't be understated how much a lot of the carnivorous or generalist animals in such areas may depend on them. Daimyos are large and not hugely rare. They're not exactly velociprey, but they're also not as rare as Zora either. They're about as common as other animals in their quest bracket but they only form a fraction of the overall species population. With their presumably explosive breeding habits like other crabs, they likely eject literal hundreds of offspring out at a time, all probably around the size of a real hermit crab themselves. Whilst only a few of these make it to daimyo size, plenty more survive to the size of a man at least, with the frequency of hermitors in such areas. So the population of daimyos likely expels tens of thousands on a yearly basis and everything can eat them. As the young grow, they gradually get more and more immune to predation, but then they're still replenished on a yearly basis. So with a rich and constant supply of food, the lake forests may support a huge amount of semi or fully specialist wyverns, like the Yans, Astalos, and Espinas, with a constant flow of hermitors pouring in. As mentioned, in desert ecosystems, hermitors are likely important in supporting other animals too, like cephalos schools. And Espinas may be poised to take maximum advantage here. With its large size and robust jaws, it can likely eat any hermitor, and potentially even the daimyos themselves if sufficiently hungry. 
its large gut and long retention times mean it's able to digest all of them too. Espanas's armour may well have a high mineral cost that Hermitor shells can contribute to. Espanas's jaws may also be especially handy here. After the first Daimyo hunt in Sunbreak, it seems even fierce predators like Luna Garen may struggle to pierce a Daimyo or Shogun's shell. Whilst they may be slow and unresponsive monsters much of the time with relatively poor sight, they're still pretty heavily armoured, and many wyverns may still struggle to get at their succulent crab meat. Espinasa's deep mandible and large teeth can likely handle stress as well, and perform a successful job as crab crackers. Its hunting behaviour can be applied well to the giant crabs, and there's no shortage of them. So indeed, they make for an ideal food. And Daimyo's spawning efforts may be partially responsible for converting the Espinas ancestor to this lifestyle too. Such events are likely attended by many animals of all sizes, and in our own world, termite emergencies are capitalised on even by large predators like lions and hyenas, who lap up the fat-rich bugs. In Monster Hunter, even large predator wyverns probably aren't above hoovering up the baby hermitors at spawning events, and Espinas ancestors may have adapted over time to stick to this resource, and were able to expand it to other prey like hornitors as well. When needs must, and possibly in dry months, Espinas may occasionally dabble in larger meals, with little variation in hunting strategy. Lying camouflaged on the forest floor with very little movement, Espinas may still be able to hunt much like a snake or a crocodile might on land. Lying beside forest trails waiting for potential targets to stray too close before making a lunge for them. Espinas hunts likely don't have much of a chase outside the initial lunge, regardless of a strike or not. And on successful hits, prey are likely killed outright via the force of the bite. Any rare escapees from a bite likely leave a sufficient blood trail for Espinas to follow at its typically leisurely pace. Espinas may also be picky about where it hunts when going for bigger prey too. Puff adders, often thought to be the kings of sitting around and doing nothing all day, will go on considerable travels to find appropriate ambush spots when food deprived to try and increase their odds of a meal. So Espinas may be similar carefully picking ambush spots for maximum success at any point in its territory. Its keen nose also allows it to sniff out carrion, and Espinas will readily scavenge at any opportunity, not being the type to pass up a free meal. Rainforests aren't ideal areas to be scavengers. The humid environment speeds decomposition, and hosts huge invertebrate and microorganism communities much more likely to pick bodies clean before you do so carrion may be a rare retreat for Espinas. This can vary from rainforest to rainforest depending on the guild of invertebrates and microorganisms, but for the most part, warm and wet means fast decomposition. So speed is of the essence for Espinas to find carrion, and it may often be in the form of stolen kills from Nagakuga, when it dares to order off menu and go for something closer to its own body mass. Despite the noise and chaos of a kill, Smell is likely Espinas's key method of finding carrion, and it may be possible others are prepared to freeload off this as well. Hypnocatrice is a bird wyvern sympatric with Espinas and Nagakuga in the Great Forest. In the original art book, it's described as a condor wyvern, and its hooked bill does seem well suited to pick at carrion. Hypnocatrice can fly, but finding carrion by sight in a dense rainforest is hard. After condors, king vultures are the largest neotropical vultures, and forage mainly by sight while soaring at high altitudes as most do. But they're not looking for carrion. They look for smaller Cathartes genus vultures like yellow-headed or turkey vultures, who use smell to find carrion. And once they've found something, the king descends to claim his share. If Hypnocatrice is similar, it could well use Espinas to find kills, following it from above to find carrion. King vultures will also do this with jaguars themselves, following the cats to see if they make a kill, or waiting in the vicinity near large potential prey items. Hypnocatrice is then uniquely equipped to deal with Espinas before he hoovers up all the food. For all his fire and resistance to toxins, he's still vulnerable to sedatives, and Hypnocatrice may well drug it unconscious so it can feed. In the Great Forest, Hypnocatrice, Nagakuga, and Espinas may have something of a rock-paper-scissors relationship over kills, 
with Espinas robbing Nagakuga and then getting robbed in turn by Hypnocatrice, who runs the risk of Nagakuga coming back once Espinas is asleep. An important part of Espinas' diet too is the assorted toads that live in the leaf litter. Whilst these can be caught in similar fashion to Hornitors, and may only provide a small portion of Espinas' energetic requirements, they do provide it with key toxins, and this is known as sequestering, the act of eating someone or something toxic and then being able to utilise said toxins for yourself. It's hard to say if this is innate or learned in Espinas, whether they became immune from millennia of feeding by shoveling through leaf litter and just let it happen, or if they preferentially select for poisonous food to make themselves a less appetising target. Mammals that select for venomous or poisonous prey in their diets can often develop immunities to the toxins, with mongooses, honey badgers and hedgehogs being examples, but surprisingly pigs too. Pigs will eat anything, but with their rootling lifestyle it could also be that they're going to come into contact with snakes anyway, regardless of attempted predation. Espinasse's leaf litter foraging may mean he didn't have much choice but to evolve his own resistance or ways of dealing with it. But on the other hand, in some cases toxin sequestration is a deliberate evolutionary goal for protection, independent of just becoming resistant to the toxic foods you eat. And some animals will preferentially search for toxic foods for protection. Some garter snakes will do so especially when the females are gravid to pass the protection onto their eggs and young. So perhaps gravid female Aspinas also use the breeding season peak of energy to strenuously search for as many toads as possible to get the eggs and young the largest toxin boost. And it's not just the spines that are poisonous. Espinas can spit poison with its fireballs, and even its blood is toxic too. So clearly this goes beyond just armouring itself, and Espinas out and out makes itself poisonous to eat even if its opponent does manage to win. Denying its opponent any calorific reward after what is likely to be a strenuous kill at best may be just another factor in Espinas' defences to make it even less palatable, and one of the most well-armoured wyverns. Outside of toxins, Espinas is still very heavily armoured. Whilst not completely flightless, Espinas still rarely flies, presumably due to the added weight of its thick, plate-like armour. Even if this wasn't very tough and venomous, the added thorns mean near any predator getting to grips with Espinas runs the risk of getting itself severely lacerated on its armour. And like many aspects of its life, this likely stems from its slow, sleepy lifestyle. Espinas sleeps deeply, taking considerable physical effort to forcibly wake, and can be sluggish even when fully roused. If Espinas wasn't as heavily armoured, this would put it in some deep trouble. Too large to fit into any real shelter, Espinas sleeps out in the open, and would be at considerable risk if not so powerful. Strong as it may be, Espinas isn't indestructible and roaming elder dragons or nomadic brute wyverns like Devil Joe or Glavenous bulls that have been seen in the same areas could well pose a threat, and without sufficient protection a soundly sleeping wyvern would be an easy target. Thick plate and venomous spines do nicely to dissuade sheepish threats, and to keep a determined attacker at bay until Espinas can rouse itself to fight. Whilst many other animals probably prefer to let sleeping Espinas lie, we do see a few exceptions. Espinas runs off a Nagakuga that rudely wakes it by flinging Velociprey at it. But the most notable conflict is with Kushala Deora, and it's hard to tell where exactly the strife here comes from. Kushala generally isn't regarded as an exceptionally belligerent species, and Espinas isn't really awake enough of the time to get a reputation for violence without prompt. Kushala at least partially supplements its diet with ore, and Espinas eats mainly small animals and carrion, so there's not much resource overlap to trigger competition too. One explanation could be it's from Kushala's impact on the environment. Even without his ambiguous weather powers, Kushala is still a wind cannon on wings. He can fire powerful gusts and creates vortices around him, and whilst this may not destroy the ecosystem despite the hand-wringing of the guild, it may cause localised disturbances to some of the wildlife, and especially to the small animals Espinas likes to prey on. Cheetahs and lions are now known to have much more dietary overlap than first thought. 
due to male coalitions taking large prey. But before this knowledge, one suggestion for seemingly uncalled for hostility from behavioural modelling was that more predators of any kind in an ecosystem increases prey vigilance, and that killing other predators reduced prey vigilance of any type, this benefiting the top predators with a sufficient means to kill smaller competitors. So, in a similar vein, this may be why Espinas takes exception to Kushala. His wind blasting could increase vigilance or cause Espinas's prey base to move off, or become harder to catch in other ways, causing them to be so comparatively aggressive to Kushala. And this may well be unique to Kushala Deora, as most other Elder Dragons don't enter forested environments that often. Only really Camellios, who has a much lesser impact on prey behaviour even if he directly competes with Espinas himself. This habit may make Espinas pretty popular with the locals. Espinas may well eat smaller animals, but it also spends a lot of time resting and probably doesn't expend effort trying to catch things too quick for it. For a lot of the smaller residents of rainforest areas, this likely means that Espinas may provide some blanket of cover from potential predators. This isn't unheard of, and birds especially may nest in the proximity of a potential predator that may even cost them a few young to keep a much worse predator at bay. Geese, herons, and wood pigeons are just a few examples of this so-called predator protection, and the unique guild of rainforest predators may well facilitate this. Yangaruga and Astalos probably have a pretty high dietary overlap, of invertebrates partially supplemented with smaller animals, up to the size of a dominant male raptorial bird wyvern, whereas other similar flying wyverns like rats can and would likely eat velociprey and other smaller sized ground animals if they came too close, they show no fear of Espinas. So whilst it is a risk, as Espinas does share a prey base with Garuga and Astalos too, it's better to go with a sleepy low energy devil with the lower calorific demands you know, than the crazy one you don't. So for my thoughts on Espinas, I quite like him. Frontier's reputation is now pretty mixed, but when it first came about, many, myself included, really wanted it for the West. Espinas looked really cool, and it seemed so wonderfully well suited for the Great Forest as this great rosebush wyvern. The leech and the wolves also seemed pretty cool, and then as time went by and things progressed, Frontier fell off the deep end and began making garbage, and suddenly, Espinas never coming to the west seemed like a small price to pay to avoid... them. But now he is here, it is nice to have him. His design and ecology fit well with him needing so much armour for such a sluggish, sleepy wyvern. Whilst I haven't fought him in Frontier, his fight is... alright in Sunbreak. I'm hesitant to call it amazing, as Espinas feels like a greatest hits rendition of other flying wyvern moves. He's got the general moves like tail sweeps and hip checks, wrath fireballs and stomps and bloss charges and horn swings, but not much unique to him. There are unique spins on said moves, like the multi-element fireballs and the fact he can multi-charge even more than Tigrex, but I'd have really liked him to get more unique moves of his own. He's not a bad fight by any stretch, but I wouldn't call it exceptional either. I can also see why they removed his passive phase too. Sunbreak isn't Frontier 14 years ago, the monsters even in Master Rank go down fairly easily, and the passive phase would make Espinas a 5 minute fight even if you weren't speedrunning it. I do like his lore and behaviour too, it's really nice to have a roughly elder strength monster who isn't a raging, death mad ecosystem blower upper, and instead just wants to chill, and if anything is the guardian to the areas it inhabits. I also liked its rivalry with Kushala. It's a nice thought that the base elders can get a non-elder monster that serves as their foil and slash or rival. And then Brown Espinas sort of ruins that with its god-awful intro cutscene incinerating the King of Fire. I don't think there's anything to stop him coming back in an A-team game too, so I'm keen to see what they do with him environmentally there. Overall, Espinas still comes in as a pretty solid entry to the series. I am a little concerned he could be a final nail in the coffin of Monobloss' chance to come back, so we'll have to see how 6 and 6U go. I think for anyone not back in those games, their time in the franchise is up. Speaking of time being up, let's talk about Frontier. And for anyone expecting a tirade of negativity, you're only half right. Frontier did run for 12 years, so it shouldn't be too big a surprise it managed to get at least a few things right in that time. 
and I definitely don't hate all the monsters in it. The leech leviathan is okay, the hummingbird was alright. I thought the wolves were okay, but apparently they're a terrible fight, so whatever. But there should of course be limits in place. When Espinas was announced, one thing you saw being said a lot was, the floodgates are open. And I don't know if you've ever seen a flood, but there's a reason the water is often brown, and it's not just mud. Floodgates exist for a reason, and it's to keep the feces and Bilhazia out. Plenty of Frontiers monsters are just terrible concepts. Full stop, but also in the context of the mainline series too. Whilst the series was never quite as good at mainline at creating quality monsters, the earlier ones at least had some ecology in mind, but as things progressed it became more and more about excessive arena fights and particle effects with no restraints, and as such most of the later editions belong in Digimon or Final Fantasy. Luckily, it does seem Fujioka and Sujimoto are going to have quality control in future on who gets in and if. I also find it quite amusing how the people who say World had too many flying wyverns are the exact same people demanding Boglodon, his edgy subspecies, and his mid as hell 2010 moveset come to mainline. Though with Frontier now ported, this seems all but a non issue. As said, the worst Frontier monsters don't really have much going for them ecologically and mainline series isn't in a struggle to create its own endgame boss monsters, who themselves only often exist in particle effect filled arena battles anyway. So the niche they would fill is never really going to be open for them to slot in. And with Frontier now available to play for all, there doesn't seem to be much to be gained from them coming to mainline. This is not to say that everything was terrible, and even if many monsters were crap, there was still admirable ideas or mechanics embedded within them. Espinas' cousin can absorb ailments used against it to then use against the hunter, which is pretty creative. That monkey that carries its baby on its back is a pretty good use of bringing baby monsters into the game, and a completely new spin on a minion mechanic. Similarly, a few hardcore monsters had moves that could be used to spice up some of the worst old gen fights, if you took away all the disgusting and idiotic particle effects. Indeed, as with mainline, I believe probably any monster can have at least one thing it can offer, even if I may hate it as a complete package. What are Bulfango, if not useful sources of raw materials at the game's start? Even if I'm not a fan of his design, Zenoga is still a pretty good fight with a great theme. Magnamalo? So it's wrong to say Frontier has nothing to offer the series as a whole, and some of it is good without modification. The notion of implementing meaningful and unpredictable weather in maps is a great touch, especially when it's not just cheesable for the hunter. Let the hunters have their traps they can use like the boulders and such, and have freak weather occurrences affect both parties but be biased in favour of the monsters that evolved for that environment. If a thunderstorm rolls by in the swamp, things like Kezu, Gypsros and Nursilla, if she's wearing Gypsros's hide, would be relatively immune to the lightning strikes. A sandstorm would blind and graze the hunter, but mean nothing to Diablos or Cephadrome detecting them via vibrations, and so on and so forth with other environments. If the hunter fails to prepare, they'd pay for it dearly, and in some cases, there's nothing you can do but just take your lumps. It'd be nice to be reminded that hunters aren't walking death gods, and that the monsters that came to be in such ecosystems should have the leg up in their home, rather than be bumbling idiots struggling to keep up with a levitating deity who can reach areas they can only dream of. So whilst Frontier definitely fell off the wagon towards the end, there's plenty to allow its legacy to live on, and I have said before that a solution could be for B-team games to be Frontier canon, for the fast anime experience, and have A-team games to be mainline canon for the slower, more original and restrained experience. I think a good deal of the disquiet between fans of the respective teams come from the fact that it's never certain what the next game is going to resemble, as one franchise is now more than ever trying to juggle two different styles. Having Frontier and Mainline would make things much more cut and dry, or at least as far as I can see. Thanks for watching, and thanks to AI Jose for their great generosity as top patron as well as Kay Sandom, Erengar Steiny, Phenomenon, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their continuing and appreciated support. To go through a few things from last week, yeah, no mention of Blue Kutku. 
As to be honest, I think it's about as simple as a different colour morph, and that's about it. And Garuga being a Rathian Kutku hybrid was never a true theory, but a community joke, which I hoped I wouldn't have to stress. Some were also correct to point out that Nightshade Palumu is a New World insectivore, although like Baroth, it's a Myomechophage, and is so presumably dependent on ants and termites, so it still fits with the point I was making, although I do admit I just completely forgot about him. The Flying Wife and Family Tree and Espinas Skull were created by creature design artist I Am The Kaiju King. For more trees, more skulls, and more original art, be sure to head his Tumblr and support him on Patreon. For early views and exclusive pieces, links are provided in the description. The digital behaviour artwork was created by Carmen Rider Moten, and if you're interested in more, then check out her assorted social media sites, further library of more of them that are already made, plus the content they keep producing outside of the videos. And speaking of, here's the teaser for the next one.